Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can turn to the Bible, that we can turn to the Word of God, that this Word that is given to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path to, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to feed our souls. Oh Lord, we pray that your Spirit would take this Word which he has inspired and that he would use it in our lives, that each one of us here would feed on this Word and we would be strengthened like Elijah, that we would be helped for the week that is ahead, that you, O oh Lord, would be glorified in this place as your word is proclaimed this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we have been journeying with Elijah here in this book of First Kings, we now have arrived at the beginning of chapter 19. And the curtain has come down on one of the most memorable days in Old Testament history as Elijah has faced the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and the Lord his God has sent fire from heaven and revealed himself. The people have turned back to him and cried out, the Lord he is God, the Lord he is God. And then after that, the people, he, Elijah had gone back up the mountain again. And he had prayed, and he had got on his knees before the Lord, and the Lord had sent the rain. So fire had fallen, Elijah had fallen on his knees, the rain had fallen, the people had fallen and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. The 450 prophets of Baal then had also fallen, they had been cut down and slaughtered by the brook Kishon. And after Elijah then had prayed and the rain had come, then to cap off this great day at the end of chapter 18, we find he is running there before the chariot of Ahab in the power of his God as the hand of God was upon him. And it appears then that there has been a decisive turning point in the life of the nation that things that had gone so far afoul under idol worship for so long and the drought that had come under the judgment of God had now been stayed and that it was a new day that was dawning in the land of Israel. And there was a new day dawning in the life of Elijah, but it was not the kind of day that he would have wanted or maybe expected as dark clouds were now looming on the horizon as we arrive at chapter 19. And before the day is over, Elijah, who the day before had triumphed over the prophets of Baal in a great triumph of faith there on Mount Carmel, will find himself falling in fear, despondency and depression in the midst of the wilderness, asking the Lord that he might die. And it's interesting that so often in Sunday schools, the lesson of Elijah on Mount Carmel is taught, but not the lesson of Elijah here in the wilderness. Elijah there on his knees praying in faith is taught, but Elijah here in the wilderness praying a prayer of unbelief almost in despondency, wanting to die. This we regularly skip over. But I believe that this text is very, very important to each one of us who are here this morning. Because we may be for a time up on the mountain, but we can't live there forever. The mountaintop experiences don't last. There are times when we have great faith and great confidence in God, but there are other times when you will find yourself, each one of us will find ourselves in the dark valley, in a dark night of the soul, where we will begin to question everything that we had once so firmly held to. And here is where we find Elijah then at the beginning of chapter 19 in verses 1 and 2. And what we find right away at the beginning of chapter 19, that although the people had cried out, the Lord, he is God, and had seemed to repent, Ahab's heart was as hard as it ever was. Here in verse 1 of chapter 19, it says, Ahab then told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Don't you find it interesting that he had told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, how he had killed the prophets with the sword. We must ask the question, what had Elijah really done? Elijah had prayed and Elijah had obeyed, but the Lord had done absolutely everything else. 
It was the power of God that was seen there that day, that the Lord was the living God, that Baal and his prophets were nothing. God had sent fire from heaven. God had sent the rain from heaven. God had helped Elijah and strengthened him to run before the chariot of Ahab. He was alive. The living God had done this. And here is Ahab talking about Elijah. What are the servants of God but mere men? It is the God of Elijah that Ahab should have been pointing to. He should have come home and said, oh, Jezebel, you cannot believe. We have been wrong. We have worshiped idols that are dead, that can do nothing. We must turn. We must repent. We must believe. There is a living God in heaven. Elijah is proclaiming him. We have seen his wonders. We believe in him. We must turn, we must turn the nation around. We must bring about the kind of revival and reform that we saw in the days of Josiah as he had come to discover the book of the law and turn the hearts of the nation back to God. If Ahab had truly repented on that day, this is what he would have done. And we would would have come home and said, now Jezebel, we must repent. And if she had remained hard-hearted, if she had said, no, I will continue to worship Baal, then Ahab should have done what King Azza did to his mother in 1 Kings 15. If you want to flip back there, just a couple of pages, 1 Kings 15, verses 12 and 13. What did King Azza do as he was bringing about his reforms? What did he do with his mother who had led the nation in idolatry? It says there, chapter 15 and verse 12, he put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land. He removed all the idols that his father had made. And then in verse 13, he also removed Makah, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image for Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it in the brook Kidron. If Jezebel wouldn't repent, this is what Elijah should have done, or he could have taken the path of Jehu. You remember it in 2 Kings in chapter 9, if you want to turn there for a moment, in verses 30 to 33. Because Jezebel and her rebellion against God, she will not stand forever. God sent Jehu to bring judgment And he brought judgment in many ways. And here we find in 2 Kings 9 and verse 30, what does Jehu do? When Jehu, it says, came to Jezreel, the same place there where Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah were at this time. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood spattered on the wall, on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he weighed in, went in, and he ate and drank. Now you might say that sounds rather harsh. How could someone do such a thing? Well, under the old covenant, those who led Israel into idolatry and sin in this way and brought the judgment of God upon the entire nation were supposed to be judged. Deuteronomy in chapter 13, we can make one more turn there and then we'll come back to 1 Kings and land for a while. Deuteronomy in chapter 13, beginning at verse 6. What we find there is after Elijah had obeyed the first five verses that God had commanded the killing of these prophets, these false prophets, we find in Deuteronomy 13 and verse 6 this. This is God's law. This is what he had commanded Israel to do. It says, if your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, and then notice this, or the wife you embrace or your friend who is at your own as your own soul entices you secretly saying let us go worship and serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known some of the gods of the people who are around you whether near you or far off from you from the one end of the earth to the other you shall not yield to him or listen to him 
nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him, and your hand shall be first against him to put him to death. Whether it was a him or whether it was a her, a wife in these ways, this was the command of God. But Ahab doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about his worship. He doesn't care about his word. He doesn't care about obedience. Instead, he cares about himself. And instead then of humbling himself before God and in obedience to the word of God, removing his wife in this way if she would not repent, Ahab decides to incite his wife against Elijah. That's why he's not talking about the Lord but talking about Elijah because you know Jezebel hates prophets. Chapter 18, verse 4, she'd already killed almost all the rest of the prophets of the Lord except the hundred that were left in hiding under Obadiah. And so he, he begins to say, look what this Elijah has done. And by the way, Jezebel, he killed your prophets. Because you remember in chapter 18, in verse 19, it talks about these prophets were gathered around eating at Jezebel's table. These were her pet prophets. These were her prophets. And, and this Elijah, he's killed them all. And so then he deflects away from himself, deflects toward Elijah, knowing that Jezebel, knowing her character, knowing what she would do, instead of doing what he should have done, which would have been acting like a man, acting like a king, acting like a real leader. And here in Ahab, what we find is an example of a man who acts in spineless expediency. The kind of man that too often characterizes the leadership in politics, in the church, and in the families of our day. Ahab has no conviction, he has no gumption, he has no resolve, he's blown here and there by the winds of popular opinion. He's not gonna stand for anything. Wherever the wind is blowing at the time, this is where Ahab will go. Because you can remember right at the end of chapter, eight, in chapter 18, verse 40, what, what does he allow Elijah to do but to slaughter the 450 prophets of Baal? And he says nothing. Earlier on, he allows his wife. It says Jezebel cut down the prophets of the Lord. Whether you're, Jezebel, his wife, is killing the prophets of the Lord or Elijah's killing the prophets of Baal, it matters not to Ahab. He just keeps out of the way, keeps quiet, and goes along with whatever is happening. Because Elijah had popular opinion at this time and people were behind him and behind his God, he allows him to do what he does. But now he comes home and we see his true colors again. We know who wears the pants in his household. We know that his wife is the one who is leading the charge. And so he then takes again a back seat and just lets her do what she will and says, look at this Elijah, what he has done. Provokes her in this way so that she will become angry. And so what we find then is Jezebel upon hearing this, notice what she does in verse two. So first of all, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and now he, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword, and then it says, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Mission accomplished. His wife's set, sights are set now on Elijah. She wants to eliminate him like she had done all the other prophets of the Lord. Now it's clear, we must understand from this text, that while the rest of Israel had been at Mount Carmel, while Ahab had been there, the prophets of Baal had been there, the whole country had been there, there had been one person who was missing. And that was Jezebel. Why would Ahab have to tell her anything if she had been there. She had not been there to see the mighty power of God and the great defeat that had come to her idols and her prophets. She had stayed home, but you could imagine what it must have been like that day while she was sitting at home wondering what was going on. Ahab left early in the morning, the prophets had left, everybody had gone out of the city, and there she sits, wondering what's going to happen. He's anxiously waiting for news from Mount Carmel as the hours roll by. You remember it began, the great events at nine o'clock in the morning. By noon, nothing had happened. The prophets were raving. They were calling out to Baal. Nothing happened from noon until three o'clock at the time of the offering of the oblation. It's now been six hours. She has no news at all. You can imagine she's sitting there fidgeting, wondering what in the world is going on. 
And then as Elijah went up the mountain and began to pray, she wouldn't know what was happening, but all of a sudden, she began to see dark clouds rolling in. And then the rain began to pour. And she must have been going, now what has happened? She may have looked out the window and looked and in the distance saw this chariot running madly toward the place and she looked. She didn't see any prophets of Baal, but she saw this Elijah the Tishbite running in front of the chariot of Ahab as they approached the city, approached Jezreel. And you can imagine that as Ahab arrives home and tells her what has happened and what this Elijah has done, that she must have been fuming. Just livid, absolutely vile. Who knows what she would have said to him, but she did say a few words that we have here. Our text gives us some indication. She sends these messengers and says to Elijah, so may the gods do to me more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. I will have your head, Elijah. Now there's an application here that I think is helpful as we think about this. Because very often on the heels of great spiritual advances and spiritual victories, what we find is opposition. Opposition. The life of the Christian is not one straight shot upward into heaven, but there are roads that are filled with suffering and difficulty, persecution and opposition. We find as the church takes steps forward, the devil takes steps to provide opposition. We find that in Acts chapters, the early chapters of the book of Acts. Chapters one, two, and three, the church is advancing and things are happening and everything's going well. But as chapter four arrives, we find that there is persecution that is mounted against the church. In chapter five, we have Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit. In chapter six, we have bitterness and division forming in the church between the Hebrew-speaking widows and the Greek-speaking widows because they're not getting equal distribution of food and the opposition begins to mount. We find it regularly in the days of Nehemiah. He comes set intent on rebuilding the wall. But there's opposition, Senballat and others that oppose him and threaten him and want to stop the work of God from advancing. We find Moses, as he comes to redeem the people of God, things got worse after they began to get better. Moses comes with a word from God that he's gonna deliver the people, and the first thing that happens when he goes to Pharaoh and tells the people to let them go, he says, by the way, you guys are lazy, that's why you wanna leave. I'm gonna now require you to build the same number of bricks, but I'm gonna give you no straw. And you found that the opposition began to mount, and it's the same way with us. If you are seeking to read your Bible for the first time, if you are pursuing the Lord, if you are seeking answers to what's going on in your life spiritually, if you are seeking to minister on his behalf and to speak his truth and live godly lives in your homes and bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and so on, you will face difficulty and opposition. It is guaranteed there is a war going on. We are called to stand fast in the midst of it, but we can expect this to happen. We are involved in a great spiritual battle in the unseen realms. There are rulers, authorities in the heavenly places that we battle against, not only flesh and blood. And so inevitably then, when we begin to try to move ahead, there are forces that advance against us as Elijah faced here, and we must be ready for this. Paul said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, and so on. Because if we forget this, and when the opposition comes we may then not respond in faith in God and trust in God, but in fear and unbelief, as Elijah does here. I wonder if he thought that all the battle was over. It seemed like it had been won. Baal had been defeated. Ahab surely then is gonna bring about reform and everything's gonna go well. The nation has turned back to God and all of a sudden the first thing he hears from the palace is a threat on his life. And he must have gone, well, What can be done now? If fire from heaven and rain from heaven and all of this isn't enough, things are finished. It's about as bad in Canada as it can possibly become. It's going downhill fast. It's getting darker by the day. My life is just, what am I gonna do now? And here's what Elijah then does. The text says in verses three and four, notice what he does. It says, then he was afraid and he rose and ran for his life. 
He came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah, who had run so powerfully just a day before, now makes a run for it into the wilderness. The one who had triumphed in great faith on Mount Carmel now retreats in despondency and unbelief nearly 24 hours later. He gathered up his garments and he ran before Ahab to the Jezreel and now he is running away from Jezreel into the wilderness. And why does he do this? Notice what the text says. Notice his motivation. It says, then he was afraid. What a wonder it is that a day before, Elijah faces 450 prophets of Baal and Ahab on Mount Carmel and he is taunting them and he is jawing at them and he's full of confidence and full of the spirit of God. He knows that a simple prayer will bring down fire from heaven and victory will be won. And the next day, one lady says a few words to him and he runs off into the wilderness afraid. Fear. Notice too, like throughout Elijah's life, one of the things he did regularly is he didn't make any move unless something had preceded it. And it wasn't the word, a word of a woman, but if you turn back to chapter 17 for a moment, you'll see something here, and this is very important. Elijah makes a run for it in fear. Why? And this is not a good thing. And we find then in chapter 17 and verse 2, after he had pronounced the judgment of the rain that was going to be withheld, it says in verse 2, and the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. And of course, Elijah went. Then notice in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. 18.1. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Verse 2. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. What is missing here in verse 3 and 4 of 1 Kings 19 is the word from the Lord. Elijah's going, but he's going in fear, not in faith. He is not going in faith, trusting in the word of God. It is then that God provides for him at the brook Cherith in Zarephath, and as he faces Ahab, he can do this in great confidence because God's word is being followed. God has given his word, and Elijah goes. And I think when we begin to stray away from the word of God and let fear and other emotions take us over, this is when we begin to go in our own strength and we find ourselves broken, despondent, and despairing. We must trust and believe in God and his word, even in the most difficult circumstances, even in the most fearful circumstances. For when we don't, this is how a Christian can go from the mountaintop to the wilderness from taunting the prophets of Baal to beating a hasty retreat at the word of one woman, from running in power to Jezreel to running away from Jezebel into the wilderness. And this is how faith can give way to fear. When we forget God's word and we begin to turn our eyes and look only at the circumstances, to look at the words of others, the things that are going on around us, rather than trusting in God and his word. And then we will no longer stand in faith, but we will run in fear. I think there is a, an inverse relationship, if you will, between fear and faith. The person who is full of faith has no reason to fear. But the person who turns away from faith begins to fear. Fear and faith are two things that cannot dwell together. When we have faith in the living and true God, when we can see him with eyes of faith, I mean, God is God. God dwells on the throne in heaven. He spoke the universe into existence. He reigns, he rules over all his creation. 
Nothing can happen. No one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is a father to his children. He says, not a hair can fall from your head without my will. Why? Because he's almighty. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. You think if Elijah would have thought for a moment about what had just transpired in his life and thought, well, God provided ravens for me at the brook Cherith. I was fed. I was taken care of when I trusted him in his word. I went to Zarephath. He provided food out of nothing for years at a time. He raised a widow's son at that one prayer of mine. He sent fire from heaven. He sent rain as I prayed again. And now this woman is coming after me. All he had to do was remember not her, but his God. But the problem is we give way to fear when we fail to spend time meditating on the attributes and character of our God. And sometimes it's difficult for us to do this on our own. That's why we need brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we come here on Sunday morning to sing the things we do because sometimes we need others to come and to spur us on and to remind us of who our God is and what he has done for us in Christ. And so we find then that this Elijah in some ways was like Peter. You remember him out on the boat that day and he gets out of the boat and he's looking at Christ and he's walking on the water and things are going great but then he looks at the surroundings and begins to focus on the waves and the difficulties and the trials instead of his keeping his eyes fixed on Christ and he begins to sink. And so here Elijah is beginning to sink. He's lost his focus. He's lost his faith. And yet in the midst of this, there is great hope. There is great hope because, brothers and sisters, we won't all live on Mount Carmel forever. I am thankful that the great men of God in the Bible are heroes with feet of clay. I am thankful that although David can slay a Goliath, he also sins greatly with Bathsheba. And the reason I am thankful for this is because I'm a sinner. The reason I'm thankful for the weakness I see in Abram as we've been studying him in in the homeschool co-op and looking at Abram, on the one hand, he leaves his father and his mother and his family and his homeland and he journeys trusting the word of God to the land that he will show him. And the next minute, out of fear, he sells his wife out from under him, tells her to pretend he's his sister. She gets taken in the home of a king where she could have been violated and everything else and he does this to save his own skin. And I'm going, well, thank you, God, that you were faithful to this Abram, even though he was not always faithful to you. Thank you that David wasn't only conquering Goliaths all the time, but David greatly failed and despaired, and many of his psalms are written to help us because we, too, find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, in the dark night of the soul. And Elijah, the Bible says in James 5, is a man with like nature as ours. And here we see it lived out in front of us. He fails too. He has infirmities and weaknesses. Great faith one day, great failing the next day. And I go, well, that's me. I have a God then who can deal with these things. I think all of us in some ways can relate to the Elijah of chapter 19, maybe more than we can relate to the Elijah at times of chapter 18. I want to be like the guy on Mount Carmel, but I find myself regularly like the one who's here in the wilderness. Now, Elijah then, as he's heading into this wilderness, is is both figuratively and literally heading south. He's heading south into the southern kingdom of Judah. He goes down into Beersheba, the text says. Then after taking leave of his servant, he heads further south another day's journey into the wilderness, and there he crawls under a broom tree. I find, too, one more lesson before we move on. Many of those of us who are in serve in ministry in various ways, we will find again when we put out much energy and and are in the midst of spiritual battles and giving ourselves in service to others and doing this regularly and vibrantly, we are often then vulnerable to wilderness-type defeats and desperate retreats as Elijah was here. We remember as you're ministering to your children in your home, as you're doing various things, as you're giving yourself and pouring yourself out for others, that we are holistic beings 
We are physical beings and mental and spiritual and emotional and these things are all connected. And you could imagine that this time on Mount Carmel, the energy, the life, the vigor that it would have taken out of Elijah as he had served there in front of all the people in public ministry in that way. It must have been physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally exhausting for him. This battle that he had was not only a battle against flesh and blood, he is confronting these prophets of Baal and demonic forces at the same time. And there is a need for rest. You can remember even the Lord Jesus would go away and take his disciples to go and find a place for rest. Those who are slothful in ministry, those who do not seek to follow the Lord in this way, will not necessarily find themselves in the place that Elijah is here. If Elijah was just a self-indulgent prophet like many of the other prophets in the land, he would not have been running away from Jezebel, but he would have been invited to go and eat with her at her table with the rest of them. But it's here because Elijah has so been zealous for the work of God and the forwarding of the work of God and the nation among his people and has served in public ways and poured himself out in that service that now he finds himself depleted. He finds himself worn out mentally, spiritually vulnerable. He's in need of nourishment. He's in need of a good sleep. And he's in need of great spiritual encouragement. And Elijah then at this point, he is totally done. He is totally drained. Have you ever been there? You say, oh God, I've got nothing else to give. And he says, maybe you can just take my life. Maybe I can go and leave this weary battle and go to be with you in glory. And you think, well, what a contradiction is this Elijah. On the one hand, he's running from Jezebel to save his life. And then he prays that God would take his life. He's not even thinking straight anymore. He's just totally done. He's totally spent. He's at the end of his tether. He has no more to give. He doesn't desire to go on. And it's at times like this that what you believe matters. That truth matters. I think of so many people in our country today. What do they do when they come to the end of their rope? And you believed in secularism. And you believed in evolution. That there is no God at home at all. That I'm all there is. I'm the only one who's going to help myself. You read the self-help books and these things, but when you come to the end of yourself, where do you turn? When you enter the dark night of the soul, when you come into the valley of the shadow of death, when you yourself has nothing left, where does your hope lie? Where does your help come from? So many people, for many times in their life, when things get difficult, they turn to pleasures, entertainments, drugs, alcohol, sex, vacations, other aspirations. And when things aren't that bad, these things seem to somehow fill the void. But when you hit bottom, where do you turn? Do you have solid ground under your feet? Do you know that there is a God? I'm thankful that Elijah didn't live in 21st century Canada in 2024 here in our nation. For surely if he had, some godless liberal leftist would have come along and found Elijah there and heard Elijah's prayer and said, well, Elijah, God may not answer your prayer, but the Trudeau government has answered your prayer. They have provided a way for you to die. We can give you medical insistence in dying, fill a few forms, meet with a few people, the job will be done. This is how our world likes to answer these kind of things. When we get to the end of our rope, we will help you take your own life. We will be God. We will act like God. You don't need to pray to God. Just pray to Trudeau. He'll help you end your life. He'll pay a doctor to do it. This is a great evil in our nation today. 
Because people, when they are at their most vulnerable and at their weakest, what they need is God. They need a firm foundation. They need to know that there is hope for this life and the life to come. What they need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need a savior who can save them from their despondency and keep them in the midst of their difficulty. Walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death. They don't need some messenger of death to come along. They don't need the angel of death to come in the form of a doctor's suit, but what they need is the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awful thing we have done in our land. What a great thing we need to repent of in our day. But I am thankful here that God answers Elijah's prayer, but not in the way that he had asked. Elijah prays for fire, God sends fire. Elijah prays for rain, God sends rain. Elijah prays for death, and God sends him help and life. Praise God that this child of God was not abandoned by the Lord as he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, this valley of deep darkness. Praise God that God hears and God answers. Elijah had journeyed into the same wilderness that Hagar had found herself in, this wilderness of Bathsheba with her son Ishmael when they had been sent away by Sarah, Abram's wife. You remember there, Hagar had laid her son Ishmael under a bush and thought that his life was going to be taken. She walked away a short distance from him. And there, there was one who came to meet her in her time of need. And the same one now comes to meet Elijah here in verses 5 to 8. Let us read together verses 5 to 8 of chapter 19. Notice how the Lord answers Elijah's prayer. O Lord, take my life away, verse 5 says, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, not a raven, not a person, but an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was in his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in that strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Here we see God's tender care his provision for his prophet who was in great despondency, despair, and need. This time not providing by means of ravens or a widow in Zarephath, but this time he sends an angel. And it was not just any angel. Look at what it says in verse 7. In verse 7, it describes this angel as the angel of the Lord. For those of you who have studied this with me, you'll know where I am going. For others, I will just point out that this word angel, Malak of the Lord, in the Hebrew, it can mean sent one, messenger, or angel. The Hebrew term appears over 200 times in the, the Hebrew text in the Old Testament. 17% of the time, it's used to refer to created beings that we would know as angels. 50% of the time, it's used to refer to human messengers and is translated that way. And approximately one-third of the time, it is used in reference to this particular messenger, this particular angel, the angel of the Lord or the angel of God. And if we would carefully compare scripture with scripture, I believe that it would become clear to us that when the Bible speaks of the angel of the Lord, it does so in reference to the second person of the Trinity, to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the sent one from the Lord. These are Christophanies, pre-incarnate appearances of Christ, if you question, I'll just go to one text, maybe one of the clearest ones in the Bible for a moment in Judges 13. There are many of them, but this one I find possibly in one text to be the most helpful. Here what we find is that Samson's parents are met. His mother is met by someone who comes to him and tells her that she's gonna bear a son. Her husband comes back and wants to know where the messenger this person had went. And he says, I hope they will come again to help us to know what we are to do with the child when he is born. And so the, the same one appears again to Manoah's wife and then again finally to Manoah. And in verse 15 of Judges 13, it says this. Manoah said to, and notice, the angel of the Lord, please 
let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. And then notice in brackets, it says, for Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. It was already known that this angel of the Lord was not just any angel. And Manoah didn't yet know this, but he will come to understand it, we will see. And in verse 17, it says, and Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? You may remember the words of Isaiah, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground, as had Moses at the burning bush. Then it says, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. And then notice this. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, notice, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or showed us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. Now, why do I go to lengths to demonstrate that this is not just any angel? It would have been wonderful if Elijah had been ministered to by an angel. But how much more to see the tenderness, the care, the provision of God in sending the very Son of God to this weary servant of his. Christ comes as a good shepherd to this Elijah. He doesn't come, and notice he doesn't come and castigate Elijah for running in fear. He doesn't rebuke him. It reminds me of the text speaking of this very same one, the servant of the Lord, the servant in Isaiah 42. In verses one and two where it says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not stuff, snuff out. Is your wick barely smoldering this morning? Know that the Lord Jesus Christ has not come here today to snuff it out. Are you a bruised reed? Well, he will not break. He comes to minister to you even here today. And so we find this servant of the Lord tenderly, patiently ministering to Elijah, providing food and drink and rest for him. Notice verses five and six. He lay down, slept under the broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. The scene brings to my remembrance the words of Christ himself in Matthew 11, where he says, Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Or the words of Psalm 23. How many weary saints have turned to Psalm 23 in their time of need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like Elijah, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Christ is with him. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me as Christ is doing here in the presence of my enemies like Jezebel. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And here this is a little Bethel. The word Bethel means house. Beth is house, El is God. Here is a little house of God where God has come to meet with his prophet Elijah to strengthen him, to feed him, to restore his soul. And as he falls asleep after he has eaten, the angel comes and touches him. Notice how both times he touches him in this way. Comes and just places his hand upon him. 
You place your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Psalm 139. He touches him and says, Arise and eat again, for the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. Too great for you on your own. Too great for you on your own strength. Brothers and sisters, there will come times in your life where the journey is too great for you. But we can remember, as the Apostle Paul would say in, in Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Jesus says to Paul in Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He said at the end of Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus Christ the good shepherd doesn't abandon his sheep at the time when they are suffering and despondent and despairing. He comes to minister to them, to feed them, to give them rest, to prepare them for the journey that is too great for them that is still ahead. If you look ahead and you go, oh God, the journey is too great for me, know that it is not too great for the God of Elijah. The God who sends fire from heaven and rain from heaven also sent his son from heaven to come and he will minister to you and help you and strengthen you in the journey that is ahead. Finally, in verse seven, it says, and the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, arise, the journey is too great for you. And then what happened in verse eight, he arose, ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. I pray that this morning that the Lord would strengthen you and feed you through his word, not only this morning, but daily. Go to him, and in the strength of that food, he will carry you on. The journey may be too great for you, but he will help you. He will strengthen you. He will carry you on until the end. You may not live always on Mount Carmel, but God was there on Mount Carmel with Elijah in the time of his great faith and his great victory. But then when Elijah went into the wilderness and headed south and found himself at the very bottom, it was there too that he meets the Lord Jesus Christ in a whole new way. Not only a God of power, but a God of grace. Not only a God of strength and fire, but a God who comes and feeds and ministers and comes next to us and feeds us with his word, strengthening us for the journey that is ahead. And Elijah then in the strength of that food could go on and I pray that this morning in the strength of this spiritual food from the word of God that he would carry you on and that in times of need in times of difficulty you would regularly return to him and to his word and seek the strength that only Christ can provide let's go to him in prayer this morning oh heavenly father what a great God you are And Lord Jesus Christ, what a great shepherd you are to our souls. I pray that, O oh Lord, in the midst of the difficulties of life and the struggles and the trials that we face, that we would, O oh Lord, never forget your word, never forget its promises, never forget that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised never to leave us or forsake us that he has said he would be with us always to the very end of the age, that he watches over us in such a way that not even a hair can fall from our head without his will. O oh Lord, strengthen your people. Strengthen us for this week. Strengthen us for the journey ahead, O oh Lord. We recognize that life in this fallen world can be difficult and full of dangers, toils, and snares, but I thank you that the grace that saved us is the grace that can carry us on. And you, Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, comes and ministers to us in our greatest time of need. Minister to each one's soul here this morning, O oh Lord, and may we go out as those who administer to others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many people who are hopeless and without God and without you in the world. They have turned away from the only source that can help them, the only one who can take them until they are safely home in glory with you. We pray, O oh God, we would talk of this Jesus Christ as the world proposes its solutions in death, that we would propose the King of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, and many would come to trust in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.